from Microbe TV, this is Tuivo, This Week in Evolution, episode number 94, recorded on September 27, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today from Salt Lake City, Nels LD. Hey there, Vincent. Hi from LD Lab Studios. Um, you know, we almost connected in vivo twice here, a couple Missed connections for Twivo. Oh, uh, yeah, it was too bad. 94. Yeah, so what did you have cooking? You're about to come this way, if I'm remembering. So I was going to go to uh, Salt Lake City to do um, a Twiv. There's a retrovirus meeting out, up at Snowbird, right? That's the name of that yeah, place? you're right. And they were putting on a little play, a science fiction play. <laughs> and I was going to talk with some of the principals on a Twiv and, and uh, was all excited about it. Uh -huh. uh, and my flight got canceled. It was a late day flight, you know, so there was nothing out Shoot. that day, nothing out the next day that I could get there in time. So then Nels and I were going to hook up on Saturday and do a live stream, right? Exactly. Right here at LD Lab Studios. I think I've had one other person come to do a show. That was um, the um, virologist <clears throat> Marco Vignuzzi was yeah, here right. coming, passing right. through town and we did an episode with him sitting here. At LA Lab Studio, but yeah, I was getting pretty jazzed up. I had, I won't say that I cleaned up the place, no offense, but I yeah, was uh, no problem. <laughs> ready to host oh, you here. Bad. <laughs> we'll do it some do, other time. We were going to do a uh, a live stream and go for a little walk around. To yeah, check exactly. Out the, uh, the environment, but uh, yeah, the uh, I guess it was the weather. So yeah, we'll try it again. We'll try it yep. again. By the way, I forgot to mention that you're listening to the podcast on the biology <laughs> behind what makes us tick. That's Twivo. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. I want to thank our moderators today. We have Barb Mack, UK. We have Andrew from New Zealand. Mm. We have, um, I saw Steph from San Francisco. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. And let's see who's with us today besides our intrepid moderators here's nicola from italy 22 welcome C. back Ooh. let's see what the weather is here uh yeah. we've been we've had rain for the last four days today for the first time it's blue skies mm. 20 degrees celsius there nice you go. i'm uh, scrambling to find out here so i'm um and my office actually is maybe much cooler. Um, I'm, uh, not, <laughs> this is how I know fall has arrived is when the AC at the office is overpowering the actual weather outside. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. it's actually um, almost 80 degrees Fahrenheit scale. But wow. in my office, I think we're down to about 65 at the moment. So if I'm if you um, <clears throat> sense that I'm shivering yeah. or becoming hypothermic, please um, alert the proper authorities. Uh, across the channels here, but yeah, you know, and then Vincent, I was uh, almost in your neighborhood or I was in your neighborhood and almost connected um, mm -hmm. at a meeting at Cold Spring Harbor, the uh, microbial pathogenesis meeting, which was outstanding, um, but right. couldn't quite shake free. And plus we had, speaking of weather, we had the um, Hurricane Lee was making a potential mm -hmm. grazing blow. I think it didn't in the end really affect anything out there in New York or Long Island, but um, that was enough to scare me away. But we'll all, I'm, that's still on my list of things to do as well as to join you at the incubator. Um, yeah, there. I mean, I'm running around so much, I might as well stop off some of the time at uh, Salt Lake. So we'll, I'll be out there. Don't worry. Both directions. We also Claire have Claire. from the UK. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> uh, Tom Bell, that's in uh, uh, Ohio, right, Lori? Mm -hmm. Remember from the, from the live stream last week. Welcome. Yeah. Good to have you here, Lori. University of um, in Toledo, Ohio. What university? L university of Illinois in Toledo? Or is it the University of Toledo? Is it the University of Ohio? Let us know, no. Lori. We are just lost. We don't it's know not what's Illinois. going on. I can yeah. <laughs> it's not Illinois. Uh, here's Kent, the cat guy, Saudi Arabia. Wow, fantastic. Wow, 89 in the desert at night. Oh, man, Oof. I'd like to actually be in the desert. I, I want to visit that part of the world. I'd love to yeah. visit... Uh, Agree. Uh, all these different places. Uh, Pete is from London. Just got too dark to carry on in the garden. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, man, it's like 9 p.m. <laughs> exactly. That's right. And fall is approaching. So in the northern hemisphere, getting darker earlier. 
I Welcome. know Noir is from New Mexico. Greetings. Peter Greetings. S. is in Boulder, not too far from Nels, mm. right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Across Philip the Rocky Wales. Mountains. Welcome, Philip. Uh, genetics is Phoenix. <laughs> Great handle. It, as is from Saudi Arabia. Wow, we have two people from Saudi. Cool. Fantastic. I'm, always, I'm impressed when people from all over the world show up, right? That's that's kind of that's kind of the energy here. That's the that's what keeps us coming back. Thank you all. Maureen is in North for joining us in real time. Ohio. Other shade is in Amsterdam. Very Great. cool place. Roosh Roosby is in uh, Albany, New York, not too far from here. Tomball, Texas. Sorry, Lori. <laughs> oh, wrong, wrong part of the country there. I'm totally off. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, Duncan, uh, North Wales. There you go. How's your uh, Welsh? Can you pronounce that? Carnafon. No. <laughs> I don't know. Probably wrong. But that's but cool. That's pretty uh, you, cool. <laughs> I won't even attempt it. <laughs> Joseph is in Ontario. Oh, that's great. We have a Canadian connection with our paper today. Actually, we'll get into the some yeah, work we, coming um, out of the University of British Columbia. So uh, we, this is our good, interested crowd here. Welcome, everybody. Uh, Nels and mm. I will be teaching you evolution for the next hour and a half. But it's mostly mm. Nels. As I said, someone said <laughs> earlier, is this is Nels going to be here? And I said, yeah, it's Nels's show. I just pushed the buttons. <laughs> Nels is the evolutionary a- biologist. It's a true collaboration here. It wouldn't happen um, without the two of us coming together. And all of you joining us, that's really the secret ingredient, or maybe not so secret ingredient, the essential ingredient. Do you think it's a symbiosis of two? (laughs) Well, we're already moving here into our our topic. I like that segue. That's really good, Vincent. So, Actually, for for you and I, it's a symbiosis of millions because within us are symbiotes, right? (laughs) That's that's right. And that's kind of what our sort of uh, uh, life imitating art or art imitating life, I guess, or science imitating life. That's what we'll be doing here today. And so like, just like you're saying, or we're, we're not bluffing when we're saying that it's all of you who really uh, stir the pot here. So um, Vincent got a great note from Fernando. I think we've heard from before, but um, with some suggestions on papers, there's a list of about six or seven of them, all of them great. Um, and we just picked the one from the top of the list. Mm-hmm. Am I, are, you, are you hearing me okay? I think I'm, st- I'm a, a little glitch on my computer, but hopefully I'm yeah, coming it's through. Yeah, kind of, it's just dropping out temporarily here and there, but okay. it's, uh, I get the gist. Okay, a little you're delay. You're Nels, right? You're Nels, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Hope so. A little time delay here. But so Fernando, um, we just went from the top of his list. So he said, um, hi, Nelson Vincent. I just skimmed this. It's a, a link to a really interesting paper at Current Biology, one of the journals that we somehow keep returning to again and again. Um, and the uh, uh, setup here from Fernando is a pretty wild symbiosis slash evolutionary conflict story. The host here is an algae, a green algae, uh, a cryptomonad, and it involves uh, several bacteria, viruses, transposons, all thrown together in an uneasy alliance. And so, yeah, that's enough to perk our radar, to say the least, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and get us going on this one. So um, the title of the paper, thank you for putting up, a single cryptomonad cell harbors a complex community of organelles, bacteria, aphasia, and selfish elements. That kind of reminds me of that, you know, that the setup for the <laughs> classic joke. Of course. Uh, minister, a rabbi, and an engineer walk into a bar or whatever. Um, here it's a bacteria, aphasia, and a selfish element walk into a cryptomonad. But so the, you know the you know the converse <laughs> of that. There's another one. No, Two Irishmen oh. walk out of a bar. It can happen. <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> Is anyone from Ireland on the call? Hopefully on the live stream, we'll we might uh, the letter bag might be filled with uh, responses to that. Well, that's a Dixon joke, but that's it's, a good one. Uh, so it's, it's yeah. kind of in friendliness <laughs> yeah. and jest. Of course, absolutely. Um, so the authors here, not from Ireland, but from, um, as I was hinting at, um, British Columbia. So Vancouver, Department of Botany. This is Patrick Keeling's lab, who's the last author, first author, Emma George. Um, 
who I think is now a postdoc, maybe at Scripps in the San Diego area, um, which will make sense. So we're talking about an aquatic critter here, the algae, the cryptomonads. I think these are freshwater. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as you open up the hood of the cell or look, peek under the hood of the cell, um, what they're describing as a community of genomes coming together, a uh, complex community of organelles, bacteria, phage, selfish elements. So seven um, members um, or, or genomes all within a single cytoplasm of the algal cell. So pretty wild. And um, also, you know, some names kind of in the middle there, Vincent, that might look a little bit familiar. Um, Julius Lukosch there, I think, is the third to last author. Mm -hmm. We did a paper not too long ago on Twivo. I'm blanking on the exact episode number, um, looking at the evolution of the genetic code and the loss mm. of stop codons and some unusual right. critters out there. So some of the leaders here and kind of thinking about these wild examples of biological diversity around us. Um, and so, you know, symbiosis. So the, as we've discussed on many Twivos, the idea that these um, bacteria or similar prokaryotic cells that become associated or engulfed somehow by eukaryotes, that would be the host in this case, the algal cell, um, and then these long running, or as Fernando put it, I think really beautifully, these uneasy alliances, the mitochondria mm. feels like a pretty stable alliance in our own cells. Um, but then they're all, you know, you kind of, with each snapshot of evolution, you might catch what will become the next mitochondria if you just like return a billion years later or whatever. And so I think it's really fun to kind of think about it in that context of things getting a little bit more. Um, complicated, messy, chaotic, and whether or not these alliances might persist. And maybe to remember, you know, I think at least for me, it's like not being too um, enamored by the data that we have in front of us today. So like when the the original symbiosis of the eukaryotic cell that involved the mitochondria, a few other cases, plastids and chloroplasts, et cetera, those are probably just as chaotic or even more so. Maybe there were communities of dozens of genomes that were maintained for a while and then somehow as it all got sorted out through the evolutionary process of selection we ended up with the eukaryotes and the mitochondria as sort of this longer running success story but um i think it's good to remember that like you know life is probably more chaotic and closer to this sort of messy scenario that we see in some of these modern cases these these present day cryptomonads and so maybe let's spend a minute just trying to um calibrate here with what we're working with. So the <laughs> cryptomonads are a group of algae. Um, and already they kind of, right? yeah, cryptomonads, they already have a head start on all of this sort of containing many genomes. So in addition to mitochondria, um, I think most, if not all have plastids. And so we're probably most familiar with the plastid called the chloroplast, which has chlorophyll, the process of photosynthesis in plants. Um, and then the green algae, right? They're also doing photosynthesis. So common in freshwater, I think the species that we'll be grappling with today is a freshwater. Is there about 50? Oops. Nels left. Hey, Nels. <laughs> Nels went away. Let's see if we can get him back. Um, uh, hopefully he'll know he's gone. Let me text him. There you go. He's coming back. Hey. Hello. <laughs> Sorry about that. This is our first uh, internet cutout, I think. Where did you lose me? Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a pop quiz. Were you, were you paying attention? I was, ram I was starting to ramble on about the cryptomonads and what yeah, they are. Just, just talk about cryptomonads. You didn't get very far into that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've switched on to a different internet connection, my backup internet connection. Hopefully we'll do a little bit better here. Um, on the Wi-Fi actually versus the ethernet connection. So um, yeah, cryptomonads, group of algae. Um, did, did I mention, did I get through photosynthesis? Did that come through? Talked about plastids, yeah. Yeah, okay, great. So this guy's fresh water. Um, these cells are about the size of our own, 50 microns. Um, we obviously have trillions of these cells. What's really cool um, about cryptomonads is what distinguishes them are these um, organelles called ex um, extrusomes or ejectosomes. And so this is probably um, a consequence of predators, predator prey interactions, the evolution of, of these conflicts, life or death conflicts, eat or be eaten, or in this case, um, mm. be eaten or escape. So I think under sort of stressful perturbations, they launch these um, 
spiral ribbons, actually. Their cells are irritated by mechanical, chemical, or light stresses, and they discharge. It causes the cell to actually make a zigzag course, which makes it harder, potentially, for a predator to, to consume this thing. I um, and that's that. I, I do. That <laughs> you have you uh, you produce ejectosomes. Is that yeah, <laughs> big ribbons, extra you know? zone? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, so yeah, really interesting, just from a cell biological standpoint. And then as you, as I said, kind of uh, open up the hood here and ask from a genetics standpoint or an evolutionary standpoint, all of these different sort of competing genomes potentially that are somehow accommodated by the single cell, the single cytoplasm, and so. It's kind of a fun story um, from the authors here. They give us at least a little bit of a hint of kind of where this species came from or how they got into this. So the Cryptomonas, it was just known not by its species name, but just by sort of a collection tag. It was uh, SAG 25-8.80. I don't know if any of our viewers are over in Scandinavia, but I think this algae was um, collected maybe in and around Sweden about 50 years ago, put into mm -hmm. this big culture collection where it was then continuously passaged. So it actually was never frozen down. It's, I think they estimate it's gone, undergone something like 4,000 generations um, of replication since it was first collected. And we'll get back to that point maybe in a minute or two, because it has some kind of cool implications as they're sketching out the, the symbiosis here. Um, symbiosis, by the way, we often, we've talked about it some on a few other episodes. You know, you often think about that as like this cooperative scenario, everyone's getting along. Um, you can also, put this into a slightly more, I think, realistic um, framework, which is that symbiosis is just sort of like a um, ongoing addiction where, um, you know, like, so the mitochondria, for example, most of the proteins are encoded by our own nuclear genomes. Um, they get, the genes get transcribed, translated into proteins, they get transported to the mitochondria. And so for the mitochondria to per persist, it's addicted to our, our cytoplasm, our host cells, and then vice versa. Um, our cells would be in a, a lot of trouble if we didn't have functioning mitochondria producing ATP through the electron transport chain and sort of conducting all of this metabolism that's necessary for And so cooperative in one sense or sort of addicted in another um, is kind of an interesting way of framing this. Um, and so um, with that in mind, the um, you know, there was some hints that there might be more going on with this cryptomonad than others. So already... As we said, we have a plastid, so the chloroplast, the mitochondria. There's also um, this thing called a, uh, what is it, a, a endomorph of the nucleus, a, re a highly reduced nucleus from another, so a nucleomorph, sorry. And it has about 500 genes in it. So, and then of course you have the nuclear genome. So that's already four genomes, kind of as a standard operating procedure for all cryptomonads. Um, but then when they're looking at this thing, I think this is like microscopists, you know, over the decades, looking at this specific one as it was being passaged in this collection, they also noted what looked like intracellular bacteria in addition to those organelles. And so this would be kind of like a modern day example of sort of like auditioning to become that endosymbiont, that mitochondria or plastid of the future. Um, but even in addition to that, um, virus-like particles. And so now we're starting to get into this like these layers of complexity, sort of the fleas of the fleas of the fleas, right? So mm -hmm. you've got the host cell that's then accommodating a bacteria, the flea of the flea, and then the virus of that yeah. uh, bacteria. And, and, you know, and then if you put in the selfish elements and maybe even look into those viral genomes, you can add another layer of fleas. It's fleas all the way down, basically, almost like uh, the Russian doll scenario, but for so, so um, now biological this, genomes. Yeah. Presumably, this phage is infecting one of those two bacteria. We're going to see a little bit more about that, right? Yeah, exactly right, which is a pretty cool use of sort of some of these modern tools, both to kind of come at it from a couple angles to make a pretty strong um, case for which um, yeah. of the bacteria that that phage, the virus of the bacteria, which, which one it infects. So, so now it's the nucleomorph. Uh, right. This is from another endosymbiont, they think, or what, what's the origin of that? Yeah, that's exactly right. And so um, the um, it's almost, I think, it's the, um, you know, sort of an additional, what would have been another plastid. In the, it's a, I think they describe it as a secondary endosymbiont. So somehow there was an interaction with red algae in the history of the cryptomonads where this came online. And the nucleomorph, it was a little mysterious. And I confess, I don't know, this isn't, um, this isn't my specialty here, 
But um, what they do share is that the nucleomorph, so this is this, you know, 500 genes um, that, re that are sort of remain from that secondary uh, uh, donation from the red algae is maintained mm -hmm. on three chromosomes. Right. So super right. stable. Um, and so, you know, this is how they, they ultimately get to the number seven for like number of genomes that are si simultaneously being replicated in the species of, of a cryptomonad. That, that's um, where your, uh, your joke, seven genomes walk into a cell comes from. It, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. And so there's each of those chromosomes is almost its own genome here. So it adds to the sort of community and actually it's, you know, not just sort of a, um, you know, just a curiosity. It also really hints at like, how do you like the, uh, for each genome, there can be sort of almost this history or hints at this kind of, uneasy alliance or the, these conflicts that somehow lead mm -hmm. to this sort of at least transiently stable scenario. So I don't know if we came back in, you know, 2 million years, would there be three chromosomes? Would there be four? Would there be two? There, there could be a lot, um, you know, kind of the snapshot moment with a lot going on in the, the motion picture um, of the evolution of, of this single cell critter. Um, and so, you know, part of the, so mostly what we'll be looking at is I think the the beauty of this paper that came out, um, I think it was last spring um, or, or early summer in current biology, it's, it's really leaning on the ability to kind of for DIY genomics with long read sequencing, short read sequencing, and, and I'd say in particular, the analysis pipelines to bring the, those two massive sets of data together mm. allows you to start to de novo assemble these things and then to really pull apart, okay, here's the host nuclear genome, which they only have at low copy and they kind of set that to the side for this story but then at high copy they have the entire they can you know define these two species um megaria which is one of the um the genus of one of the bacteria that was recently acquired and relative to the mitochondria plastids etc and grelia another bacteria they could they can basically um in, at high confidence define the genomes, de novo assemble the genomes, <clears throat> and then compare them to what's known about all that diversity out there. So it's kind of two advantages, the technology moving forward, the more powerful analysis pipelines there with both long and short reads, but then also the growing collection of other just like metagenomic sequencing to really kind of put this into perspective. What are you looking at? How, who are these um, genomes most closely related to, whether it's a bacteria, a phage, so on and so forth. So basically Nels, yeah. you extract total DNA from these cells, mm. correct? And do the whole yeah. sequence from that. You don't do any fractionation and you do computational fractionation later on, right? Exactly, that's a really nice way of putting it. And then in their table, they show you the coverage here, right? So the the phage, which they call the Mankey phage, and we'll get that's into great. that. And, <laughs> yeah, we'll it. get into that. <laughs> so one of the fun things about this sort of discovery-based science, right? You get to name the stuff that you're working with. Um, and can kind of bring some style into that. They actually cover that genome 51,000 times. So that gives you a, it also gives you a rough sense of like how many of those genomes, like the stoichiometry of the genomes, how many are, you know, how many genomes as they're replicating with different strategies, whether you're a virus, a bacteria, mm -hmm. um, an organelle, uh, you know, at what abundance are you there relative to the other ones? And so not surprisingly, based on the electron micrographs, where you can see these virus particles, their numbers as they are replicating and out sort of outnumbering their hosts, that it's also reflected in that DNA sequencing, which is exactly what you said. It's just you sequence the whole mix and then you sort of sort it out later because the computational techniques have improved so much in the last decade or so to be able to do that. Um, and then, you know, the um, plastid, the chloroplast, which is like essential for um, harvesting energy from sunlight, also at really high number, about 2000 X or a little under that. The other bacteria that are just showed up to the game recently, just walked into the bar recently, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are um, a little under a thousand x coverage. Um, but that's you know that's roughly the same as the coverage they get for the mitochondria. And so you know it's kind of fun to just sort of think about that, right? That's it's sort of is evolution doing that experiment again, given the abundances here. Well, could these things even somehow replace the mitochondria? I mean, who knows what's even possible? Probably not, but um, who knows what's possible? Um, so yeah, that's, it's the one that's hard to compare is the nuclear gene, just because genome, because it's just so much larger mm -hmm. um, than the other genomes. And so you have to kind of account for that too, which is genome size, which will also influence the amount of coverage you get um, in terms of the abundance here. Um, but yeah, so there's also, you know, it's not just the sequencing. I think what this group 
um, is sort of famous for is to take that sequencing, those observations um, as far as you can, but then also to at least sprinkle in a little bit sort of like, what's your next intuition or is there evidence for what's going on here besides just kind of looking at this, besides just like peeking under the hood, actually kind of tinkering with the, you know, the engine a little bit. And so if you treat these cells with antibiotics, which should kill off mm. those bacteria, it doesn't work, right? So if those bacteria were just hitchhikers that are sort of taking advantage of that host cell without providing anything um, that might be essential back, then if you treat with antibiotics, the prediction would be the cells would go on, um, the host cells, that algal cell, would continue to propagate and maybe it would be even you know happier it's sort of like curing an infection right but instead it's the opposite result which is you if you if you try to cure them the whole thing dies which means that or implies that that host cell is depending uh not only on those organelles but it's that those bacteria now are, are providing something as well so Nels, what would you do you would take these sequences and then assemble them into context try and put all the Similar ones overlapping, and maybe then that'll give you a manky phage, right? <laughs> That's right, but it gets hard. So, like, easy for us to say as podcasters, harder to do if you're, <laughs> uh, you know, evolutionary geneticist, because um, there's also, uh, you know, when genomes are sort of when genomes come together in a single cytoplasm, what did what happens? There's a lot of genetic exchange, horizontal transfer. Mm. If the phage is integrating into the host genome, being the bacteria then how do you distinguish what's integrated in the bacteria? What sort of you would you define as bacteria? What's virus? And so, yeah, the, um, you know, as most things in life, it gets a little more complicated and, and that's chaotic and messy. And that's why you have to do a, a mixture of short read and long read to try and overlap, right? That helps. But even then, um, you, you know, there's still some limitations. And so they, they spend a lot of time in some of the um, mm -hmm. figures to try to kind of convince us that, you know, as they put together these whole genomes and even draw lines between them, yeah. that how they're interpreting it makes sense. But I think, you know, you take that part with a little grain of salt as mm -hmm. if you could isolate these things, like you're saying, or fractionate somehow, um, you know, you might actually get a different answer in some cases. And so, yeah, again, it's sort of, you know, I think it's a pretty powerful snapshot, but it's not like the resolution of your iPhone gets better every time, right? This is sort of like iPhone from five years ago or something. Like you could always mm -hmm. imagine that there's improvements there to really define the genetics. But it's pretty wild given all a single cell, all of that complexity already. The one thing as an evolutionist, which you would love to have here, right, is, and I was kind of hinting at this, so they the they can also say in addition to the antibiotic resistance, or sorry, the antibiotic sort of non-starter, you can't cure these things, um, that, but these things are, these things are also stable, right? So mm -hmm. the early EMs that showed those bacteria in the virus-like particles, those have they um, believe have been there since 50 years. So those 4,000 yeah. generations. Yeah. And so just by chance, right? Like with, as you grow in sort of the comforts of um, cell culture without predators, you don't have to use your um, extru extrusomes and eject ribbons and so forth. You might imagine if there's all of this stuff that wouldn't really help you to replicate in this sort of cushy environment that you'd let go of that. And yet here those, all those things are persisting. Okay, but as an evolutionist, what you would love is ah, why, what if they would have frozen these things down along the way, right? Mm -hmm. You've got that mm -hmm. 50 years of time. It's almost, we've talked about uh, Rechlansky's experiments with E. coli, these mm. long-term experimental evolution where you just passage again and again. There you do it in replicates, et cetera. They weren't thinking about that 50 years ago with this cryptomonad. But even if they would have, like every year, frozen back a sample of these things, then imagine the possibility of thawing them out today, sequencing all those genomes, just as we've been talking about, yeah. and then seeing what's different over that. Even, you know, I bet there'd be some really cool sort of changes um, that have occurred despite that stability of having the overall, you know, the same kind of conglomeration or community of genomes, but those genomes have changed in some interesting ways over those 50 years. Anyway, um, you know, maybe that's sort of a, a wish list for today's um, culture of uh, critters that maybe 50 years from now, given the even more powerful genomic techniques that will exist, you'll probably just like, you know, put a little drop in your iPhone or whatever, your mm -hmm. tricorder, and it will like spit out all of this uh, data for you somehow. Um, okay, so um, as we've already said, they found a couple bacteria. So the reason, so you're asking this, Vince, is I, I, as a virologist, I had the same sort of question is, who is that phage? Who's that virus really infecting here? Is it mm. the host? 
Um, the, probably not. It's not. It looks like a phage that infects bacteria, not a eukaryote. Um, but there's two bacteria to choose from. And so <clears throat> what they note is that, and so, and actually both of those bacteria are in the rickettsia family. They have a nice evolutionary tree or phylogenetic tree showing how they can separate them out among um, a lot of different species. And so I think we've talked some about Wolbachia um, in, in different symbiotic events in some of our past episodes. That's in there in the same family. Very um, successful group of symbionts in many different hosts from cryptomonads all the way to insects and farther out on the um, animal tree of life as well. Um, but these fall pretty clean, cleanly into these separate groups. And so then you can make a prediction about who the vi virus is infecting um, based on what that virus encodes, right? So just from a genetic standpoint or from a genomic standpoint, they find all of these um, anchor and repeat genes. So these are genes encoding proteins that have these repetitive elements and um, those proteins uh, interact um, with other proteins that have anchor and repeats or other proteins. And so that's a pretty well known, um, generally a eukaryotic um, family, but you see this in bacteria. So they've been acquired in a few cases, actually you see it in pox viruses as well. They have a lot of anchor and repeat proteins. So, but this phage does the same trick and they look a lot like the Megaria um, bacteria and they're different enough that that's a pretty clean, um, a, a pretty clean identification there. And so that's the middle part of the phage, the ANK, A-N-K, Anky phage, and then they add the M for the Megaria, which is mm -hmm. the, the the bacteria that they're linking it to 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 go with the Anky phage. They also, you know, again, so it's using the kind of complementary evidence as they do the um, imaging, the microscopy, either the EM, mostly the EM. So if they can, they can distinguish the two types of bacteria, and then ask where are the mo where's the highest concentration of those phage of those virus particles, and it's in the Megaria cells or associated with them. It's not perfectly clean because this thing is like infecting the bacteria um, and then replicating, rupturing, moving to other intracellular bacteria, et cetera. But it's a I think that's a pretty clean identification. It seemed pretty convincing between both the genetic evidence and the microscopy. You know, the, so. Um yeah, uh, it, it would be difficult to do a virological experiment to prove this, right? Because you have <laughs> well, this infection happens in the host cell, in the algal cell, right? Yeah, that's so right. Yeah, you can't just purify the phage and add it <laughs> and mm -hmm. see if it infects because it's it can't get in the uh, the algae from the exterior. So it's uh, you're you're dependent on these approaches to really decide yeah. what the phage is infecting, unless you uh, can do a time course and look at which cells are lysed and so forth. Yeah, Koch's okay. postulates is not easy here when you can't no, do, no. there's no potential to really do a, um, you know, to do a plaque assay, for example, to do this all the way that you would hope to. And that's kind of, I mean, that's this tension here, right? Between, I think, like classic virology, where in a lot of cases, the viruses we've picked are ones that we find in the clinic and then um, have features that make them sort of domesticatable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but then in the sort of, you know, current, um, uh, sort of, you know, moment in science, we're really excited about going out and really getting a sense of the diversity around us, the complexity around us. And so that comes at a sort of compromise or a trade-off, which it's really hard to do the kind of virology that you would want to do. And so, yeah, um, I'm speaking, um, from this mostly as, uh, you know, self-interest of, uh, reviewers coming down on our papers pretty hard for not doing the sort of classic <laughs> virology. <laughs> Not because we don't want to, just because the degree of difficulty here can yeah, sometimes yeah. slow us down. I mean, you had down. the problem with your your coronavirus <laughs> of uh, zebrafish. Zebrafish, right? correct? Yeah, yeah. So I try to call it diet coke's postulates, which can get a laugh, <laughs> but but it usually doesn't get us through review, even though yeah, I've, that's yeah. right. So yeah. anyway, um, here even harder. So you kind of do what you can, and you know we're we're not really the virology here kind of takes a little bit of a backseat to the story of symbiosis here and all of that that other complexity. So, and that's kind of where the story goes next. So, um, well, so first they actually, they do a little more, maybe a little microbiology. So to ask like, you know, how are these bacteria sort of working? So they use this, now that they have the genomes, you can make fluorescent probes and use this technique called FISH or fluorescence in situ hybridization. So you have um, single stranded RNA that's labeled with a fluorescent tag, and then it will go, it'll seek out you treat the cells a certain way so that there's um, the complementary RNA in the cells made by the, could be the virus, the bacteria, the host cell. 
if it hybridizes based on that complementarity, then you can actually localize to the structures that you see in the cell where those genomes reside, or sort of who's who um, to pull that apart. And so they do this now that they have that sequence. And so this is in figure three of the paper. I think this is a paper that's unfortunately not open access. Yeah, I had to um, get it from Nels. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's so I've, I kind of keep an eye on this. So Fernando picked this one and we're, you know, our listeners, if you find a cool paper, just send it to us and we'll, we'll consider it. As I'm going through papers, I'm, I kind of have an eye towards that. I'm really hoping that I can find ones that are open access, both to yeah. sort of encourage just myself and others of, in the community of scientists that we really need to share our stuff as widely as possible. This is behind the, uh, the so-called paywall. It's a subscription magazine. So um, with some open access, but some not. And so anyway, this one's not. Um, if folks want a copy of this, if you can't get it, you reach out to us and we'll, um, we, can, we can provide, or reach out to me. I can provide you a PDF um, for you to, to take a deeper dive here. Um, and so in figure three, they're now using this fluorescence in situ hybridization to identify the location and sort of the abundance um, of the two different bacteria that reside in these cells. Um, and it's pretty interesting. Like they, they, there's a different geography here for the two. So the in red, they show, <clears throat> um, I believe the Majeria um, and in, yes, in, in green is the Grelia bacteria. The Majeria, here it is, thank you, Vincent, is, is out near the exterior of the cell in panel C there relative to the green panel D where it's a little more to the interior mm -hmm. of the cell. And then in panel E, um, you can see the two together there. And so actually that's um, not unusual. Yeah, it, for the cells to actually accommodate the bacteria or the symbionts in different structures of the cell. And so the green ones are actually probably associated with one sort of set of structures, whereas the red ones with a different set of structures um, in there. Sort of below in panel G, you can um, are some of our favorite structures, right, Vincent? The, those are yeah. the virus-like particles. That That's, that's the beautiful. phage, the manky phage. Yeah, that's just... <laughs> just accumulating um, inside its bacterial host inside of that algal host. And so you can kind of see why scientists get sort of excited about this. It's just sort of visually stunning actually to see these things right before your eyes. Yeah, you can see the two different kinds of endosymbionts here, right? And the phage is in one mm -hmm. of them. So if you can do the staining yeah. to tell which is which, then you can see which one the, the, the phage is in. That's pretty convincing. Yeah, that's exactly right. And just for kind of completeness here, that blue, that's DAPI stain, which is picking up yeah. the LG, the algal genome, the nuclear genome. Um, and that's in that leftmost panel, panel A, that's just a light microscope view of the cell. So you've got <laughs> within that single small cell, about 10, 10 microns sort of across the bottom there, um, you've got all of these different genomes hanging out in this community. So a little bit more about the microbiology here, actually. So about the um, bacteria and what they're doing. Um, so <clears throat> what you often do um, in cases like this, when you're thinking about symbiosis, is sort of ask, OK, how does the potential kind of addiction work here? Who's providing what by looking at some of the metabolic pathways? So they do something called mm -hmm. metabolic model analysis. And so that's basically rummaging through the genomes and looking, knowing something about what are the genes that encode sort of the enzymes or the, the pathway to make certain nutrients or metabolites that the cells need um, to persist? Um, and then asking what, who encodes what. And so what's wild about these um, kind of conglomerations or communities is that given enough time and probably through, you know, you don't have to invoke anything more necessarily than random mutation and selections, things will be lost in mm -hmm. some genomes they'll, and then it will be sort of supplied by another. And so there are a few features here that make this sort of even more likely to work. And, and one is that these bacteria are pretty good. Some of their relatives in rickettsia, some that cause pathogenesis, some that cause disease, rickets, um, can actually um, secrete their proteins from the bacteria into the host cell, into the algal cell, the cryptomonad. And so they have a type four secretion system. The authors also note, though, that as they go through this, a lot of the genes have something else, a signal peptide. And so even in the absence of these secretion systems, these are like almost like microscopic needles, that, uh, um, like you're doing sort of like a, an, an injection of the proteins um, across cell walls. Um, they also have signal peptides where you can secrete um, 
um, proteins independent of that as well. And so that sort of provides the cell biology, the tools to be able to become addicted to each other. Like, I'll give you this if you give me that sort of a scenario. And that kind of, that's what really um, underlies the basis of some of these uneasy alliances. It's, it, it's a real alliance because if you no longer have the gene to make something that's or, at, along that pathway to make something essential, but you rely on that other partner, now you start to be at least locked in in ways until that gets replaced somehow, either restored or another actor, another player comes in. Um, this is sort of the basis of that. And so they don't do, I would say, uh, too deep of a dive here, but between some of the horizontal transfer, between the bacteria, that could be the virus is probably the phage, the manky phage is probably participating in this, the transfer of genes from different hosts across. Um, all of this, these sort of communication pathways, biological communication that's possible, um, sort of um, is consistent with the idea that you could really sustain this for 4,000 generations or longer um, as a community of genomes. Um, they kind of return then to the the virus um, and do a deeper dive on the virology, the Mankey phage, and they see um, what, what's common in a lot of these phages, these toxin antitoxin systems. Um, and that can start to point to, you know, sort of like dealing with immune systems, whether it's the, the bacteria, you know, if so if that phage was so successful in the sense that it replicated so much at the cost of the existence of those bacteria, you could imagine the whole thing breaks down. But then as the viruses are encoding toxins, antitoxins, there's almost this, it's, it's sort of the balance between immunity and communication between all of these genomes or these entities. And so um, how do you sort of maintain an uneasy alliance? What are the mechanisms or the biology of that? Often it's through the uh, uh, encoding a toxin, which then can be cured um, by a gene that's associated with that. And so you have all of these sort of conflicts that arise or almost these, so these selfish elements, the basis of that comes from um, the viruses and the ability to both encode and to move these between the systems. So if you're a, a bacteria with an antitoxin or a virus with a toxin or antitoxin that can sort of um, deal with the immune response um, in some of those uh, interactions, it again makes this um, sort of messy conglomeration possible. I'm, I, I feel like my rambling here is also sort of truly representing how messy and chaotic it is. I, probably what I just said in the last minute makes no sense at all. <laughs> um, but but I think that's a fair representation of what the, <laughs> what the authors are seeing here. It's just a mess um, with all these little hints at that there's, you know, kind of more going on here. There's like a logic almost to the biology being able to work based on all of these things that they're able to, to see just by sequencing all the genomes. Who was it that said anything produced by evolution is bound to be a bit of a mess? <laughs> Guy, I don't know, but he just yeah. died. The guy who did C. Elegans for many years. Oh, was, uh, Sidney Brenner, maybe Sidney Brenner. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I think Sydney. he, yes, he had some great intuition about, um, evolutionary systems here. And in fact, if we go, um, to, I don't know if you can pull up Vincent, I'm kind of skipping ahead here, but their final figure. Yeah. That's a cool one. With yeah. The picture. Let's get that up here. Yeah, exactly. That's this might, cool. it's, yeah, this is great. So this is sort of their model here. It's a, <laughs> a nice summary cartoon of the seven genomes in some of these proposed interactions or even addictions. And so up, up there in the upper left, I believe those are those extru extrusomes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. Um, the ribbons that sort of define the cryptomonas. <laughs> They're also able, when they sequence the host genome, the algal, they, this is a species of cryptomonas, um, gyro Pyronodidosa, I butchered that one, but that's that's the species um, that's been seen before. So it's um, that kind of connects it to this uh, bigger data set. But then, yeah, look at all of this. This is great. So you've got in the upper right there the manky phage that infects the um, Megeria, which is the genus, the M um, polyxenophilia. That's the species of that bacteria. You've got the Grelia uh, numerosa in blue. And so there they're diagramming and they think the phage, the, the virus that looks like that lunar lander infects the red cells and not the, or sorry, the red bacteria symbionts and not the blue ones, the Megeria and not the Grelia. Mm -hmm. You've got the mitochondria below. It's got 34 genes. So you've got the thousands of genes from, yep, there it is providing yeah, ATP please. exactly with its 30,000 genes or so. Um, you've got those type four secretion systems. That's that T4 SS effectors implying that that's sending those um, those proteins around to sort of um, dictate some of these 
uh, interactions. You've got those Ankerin genes that you find in the Megeria that you also find in the phage. You've got below that the plastid um, and the nucleomorph. So the 140 and then the 500, those are associated through that. So I think there what happened was you've got the chloroplast, which then um, itself, the secondary endosymbion event is that it gets invaded by what's then called a nucleomorph. So it's almost like two bacteria originally or similar prokaryotes coming together, I should say, the plastid and then the remnant of the, what would be the second plastid now maintained in that organelle. So that's yep. sort of the basis of that interaction. And then you yeah, see all those remember, arrows, right? Yep, go ahead. These bacteria each have their own chromosome and plasmids, as you can see. Exactly right. And so part of that, they have their own chromosomes and plasmids. And then some of these arrows, right? So this is, there's this um, um, Qanine or Qanosine biosynthesis. So that's one of these metabolic pathways. It's incomplete in the red cell. And so it needs, it relies on the blue cell. And that's yeah. kind of one of those in, interconnected. Yeah, there's this complete, yeah. Yep. And then you've got these, again, the phage encode. So the, the virus is integrated into the chromosome of the red bacterial cell that also, um, you know, encodes these anchorin proteins that they use to sort of decipher where it comes from. And then it also, they have that arrow going all the way to the plastid. And so this yeah. sort of gets at again, all of these kind of, um, uneasy alliances. And for me, when I see cartoons like this, I think it's like sort of the perfect, um, argument against intelligent design. Like think if you're an engineer, is this how you would go about designing and, or optimizing a, eukaryotic cell no it's it's absolute no. absolute chaos yeah. you've gone down this sort of dark alley of evolution as as we like to say so, and so pete, pete wants up, to to you to tell him what is a nuclear yeah. morph again what's a nuclear yeah morph? yeah no thanks i i think i um stumbled over that um uh, pretty awkwardly and and actually that cartoon helps a little bit so the nuclear morph would be a second plastid um that's associated with the first one. So yeah, so you've got that plastid. This is the basically the chloroplast right that there, has yeah, chlorophyll. Yeah. And then the NM, that's the nucleomorph. And so it's three chromosomes that were sort of remnants of a second plastid that are then they're in that they're encased in a membrane. So the genomes um, sit sort of are juxtaposed and are sort of interacting. They could probably draw if they did a deeper dive on the um, genomes there or some of the pathways you could probably do a similar set of arrows connecting in between those two that allow that sort of um, alliance to continue. Um, and so the plastid, it's sort of a remnant of the plastid, I think maybe the simplest way to describe the nucleomorph. Yeah, and that's part of a, a red algae, right? That was originally uh, yeah. endosymbiont. So they say here the um, secondary, so... Uh, the cryptomoted plastid was acquired through secondary endosymbiosis with the reg algae. But unlike most other plastid acquisitions, cryptomonads retain a highly reduced nucleus of the red algal symbiont called the nucleomorph. Yep. So uh, there was a red algae inside of this uh, green algae, and that's reduced to the nucleomorph. I guess because it's a nucleus and it morphed from <laughs> the... Original symbiont, right? And the symbiont. Yeah, that's right. And as they hint at there, usually what you might predict is that it'll just be lost. Like you've got, you already have yeah, yeah. the the genes of the plastid are like that's it's already a complete list. And so how if or how that persists is another interesting question. And I think that's probably there's more known about that um, as yeah. well. I think that's a fairly well studied um, uh, system. Yeah, yeah. But it, another they, layer of complexity here. Yeah, they have a an interesting section too where they look at the environmental distribution of manky phage, right? So exactly. Know where, where can we find this phage? So they look through all publicly available sequence data, metagenomes, and look for, for homology to a, a particular hallmark phage gene. Mm -hmm. And they can find this uh, in meta, freshwater uh, metagenomes from around the world, as well as some brackish or marine metagenomes. And they found one in uh, a freshwater lake in Tanzania, which, so they think that these yeah. are indicating, you know, the 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 um, cryptomonad with its phage, uh, its endosymbionts and phages inside of it that uh, are found uh, pretty much all over the world. So it's a successful system. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and I, I love this too. So this hints at uh, the one of the point I was trying to make a little bit up front, which is in addition to sort of the 
increasingly, increasingly powerful genomic techniques and analysis techniques. We also have the growing collection of sequences just from data sets all over the world that scientists by the day, by the hour, are mm -hmm. putting into publicly available databases. And so as soon as they defined with their genomic techniques, that phage genome, the Minky phage, then they could go dumpster diving in a sense to all those other public data sets and ask where, like, mm -hmm. just like you're saying, where can you find this thing? And, the, and immediately it's, it's sort of like value plus to your data. Is this something yeah. that's only is being seen by science for the first time? How far is it distributed? What's the genetic diversity in these populations? And it, it, you can really bootstrap a lot of knowledge really quickly um, just by having that new sequence in hand to compare it to what already exists or what, what not only what exists, but or what that, that little sampling or sliver of what we know of what exists. There's even more out there. We're still kind of in the tip of the iceberg days in terms yeah. of our knowledge of biological or genetic diversity around us. So one of the things that you have to think about is how did this ever come to be, right? <laughs> I mean, and I when know. I, you know, here on Tweevil, that's what I'm always thinking. How did these systems hmm. arise? What came first, right? You just don't mm -hmm. know what provided the selection. And so this is very complicated here because, you know, you have four major, you have quadripartite system, a phage, a bacteria, yeah. two bacterial embosymbionts and eukaryotes. Um, you know, what came first and then, or did they all come at once and some left? Yeah. Who knows, right? And as Adnell said yeah. earlier, how is this going to end up in 50 years? Is it going to, <laughs> and, and really, mo I think the most interesting is what's happening in nature, which is very, very hard to, to mm. study because it's heterogeneous and you're going to get all different kinds of, of uh, collections, I think. But if you can start to identify the selections that would, give us some clues as to why we have all these things, right? Yeah, exactly right. And so that's where comparisons can really be useful. So, right. So as you now march through other cryptomonads somewhat related to this, how many of those components are there, you know, in a sampling of diversity of cryptomonads? And so the most obvious case of this are the, like in terms of sort of asking who came first is the, so the nucleus, for, when, if you're living from a cryptomonad central world, you care about the cryptomonads, your nucleus came first. Mm. The mitochondria came next, the plastids, the secondary, probably third, or well, and there's probably already some fuzziness there. Well, actually, I think we have a letter that will get to my um, uh, mm -hmm. lack of knowledge of mitochondrial history in a moment. But um, but so certainly those, those um, bacteria, the phages, the quadripartite system, as you're describing it, that came later. But you, if you had other comparisons to closely related modern cryptomonads, then you could start to ask, are they always there? And the, and the more sort of existing diversity that you can sample, the more chance that you'd have mm -hmm. to, to begin to date those exact events based on, you know, the more uh, or the deeper back that you can infer the presence of all of these, the more likely that that was an ancient event. Um, there can be more complicated scenarios where things are lost or regained independently. But that sure. generally gives you through parsimony, sort of the simplest explanation for the number of steps it would take to have that pattern of, in this case, the genomes that are hanging out can start to give you some clues there. Yeah. These algae are not um, phagocytic at all, are they? Well, uh, not to my knowledge, but they have to get these, they have to, these things have to come on board somehow. Yeah, right? I'm and thinking so, if, yeah. you know, you, there are a lot of organisms that that phagocytose food and they take up a lot of stuff, right? Like amoeba mm -hmm. are full of junk. And so you can imagine this thing is, if this thing were a grazer, <laughs> it could be picking up uh, bacteria yeah. and other things and they, some of them just stay there. Right. Correct. Uh, yeah. And I, I would say that the, the phage bacteria combination most likely came in together, right? Cause the phage is oh, yeah. a lysogen in the bacteria. So that came in and that gets two of them right away. Yes. Agree. Agree. Yeah. That, agree. Yep. Yeah. And then was the ancestor of the cryptomonads more phag phagocytic? And then as the plastid came on, right. And then it became more Then it lost that sort of nutritional deal. And so that could also help date it potentially the more, you know, about that life history um, of this species or of these protists. Yeah. That could be very useful. Yeah. And also I, I think I have a quote here from the paper, this phage bacteria protist system is convoluted, but its persistence in culture suggests all these pressures are somewhat balanced. That's good. Yeah. And I think that's where, you know, so you can always ask as a peer reviewer or just a, a curious observer, like wh why this one versus all the others that are out there? Yeah. You know, we, could, we, yeah. we could go to a mud puddle this afternoon 
and probably find some weird critters. Um, open the up the sequencing pipelines, analysis pipelines, and start to kind of see something like this. I think they, but here, you know, it's a careful choice they made to be able to say that, you know, they had that, why did they prioritize this one? It was because it's been, they can see that it's persisted for 50 mm. years in culture. And so it gives a little more weight to it in terms of the kind of inferences you can make about the stability or the conflicts as you, so the more it's kind of coming at it, the clues from two directions that knowing that it's a little bit stable, at least on that sort of half century kind of timeline, you know, kind of I think prioritizes it that the data that you're um, analyzing could can really teach you something about how these things um, are established and persist for sure. For sure. more than just yep. it's a little more than a snapshot given that kind of window of persistence or stability here. Yep. Uh, let's get some questions here. We have. A yeah, few. great idea. Fantastic. Uh, let's see. Where was I? Okie dokie. So lichens are another symbiont. Yeah. Uh, that's very yeah cool. yes very very well studied um i don't know if we've done lichens on we have Twivo. not that's, we're yeah we we're a little undersubscribed not. in the whole plant and certainly lichen space that's so that's, uh, uh, andrew says i love it when microorganisms are not fighting each other but holding hands and <laughs> singing around a campfire <laughs> yes they, they are that's one interpretation kum kumbayas. <laughs> That's great. Tryon says, maybe in the future we will ingest bacteria that produce epitopes of virulent viruses. Oof. Well, I don't, I don't know about that. But, the, you know, the phages, the viruses that infect bacteria, are not going to do much to us, to our cells, right? It'll be other bacteria, most likely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a, I mean, that's so, yeah, if, if we start to ask that question about, okay, well, um, you know, all um, as we kind of finish up with the questions, I'll return to some a statement that I found from the, from Patrick Keeling, the um, last sure, author on this sure. paper, kind of thinking about the motivation of this work. But yeah, if we want to put it through sort of a, you know, a lens for the future or what, you know, we might think about um, in terms of expo like natural environmental exposures or how we'd use this information, um, yeah. like, like you're pointing out, Vincent, like there's plenty of bacteria that we'd like to get rid of. And so phage therapy, um, we've talked to Paul yeah, Turner yeah. on Tuivo and how you might use that to sort of a medical advantage as sort of an alternate antibiotic strategy. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think it's also really interesting as we as you think about you know the kind of nature of these interactions and the kind of biology that the plastid is conducting in terms of harvesting energy from light, and then understanding how you know these systems might be tweaking each other a little bit or enhancing this or sustaining that. If you can kind of use these natural observations to start to crack into that question a different way, yeah, could we engineer microbes to produce energy? taking advantage of these sort of next, these layers of regulation or interaction to actually sort of stack the deck of cards in our favor to, to gain efficiency out of this. So in all of the, I don't follow this too closely, but in all of the sort of green chemistry or green, you know, sort of microorganisms producing energy, pretty inefficient, even with sort of the best attempts yeah. we've taken so far. And so could these cryptomonads who've been sort of tinkering with this for hundreds of millions of years or so, can we, if we just sort of learn more about that or listen in on how they're producing energy or, or harvesting it from light, could those be ways to move forward kind of with more efficient strategies in that, in that space of kind of yeah. alternate energy sources? So Lori wants to know, are the green bacteria associated with DNA? Those are in those. Um, yes. Those, those fluorescent. So let me bring those up so we can show what uh, Lori is talking about. There it is right there. Yeah, exactly right. So right good. Yeah, good eye, Lori. I, 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 the answer is yes. So you can almost, they don't do the overlay, but if you, so they combined panels C and D yeah. to make panel E. But what Lori's asking is what happens if you combine panels B yeah. and D? And I think you're, you're right. Like you can yeah. see, yeah, right? Can see that. Yep. And so um, I believe then their EMs sort of, they don't show this maybe as closely or maybe they do. I just didn't look close enough, but the green ones are, um, I think the kind of structures that the cells have are these um, perinuclear um, sort of organelles that kind of accommodate the green bacteria. So they're, uh, I think they're on the outside. They're not, so they're not in the nucleus. They're not inside with the nuclear DNA from the host algae, which is illustrated in blue. Um, but those green ones are kind of nearby. They're sort of juxtaposed or just outside in perinuclear um, organelles that um, 
it's, it's a long enough association that the cells have actually kind of figured out through trial and error how to mm. organize the green bacteria. So yeah, a good good observation there, a good sighting. I think you're exactly right. Of course, there is it's it's just much lighter, but there is there's blue signal even in the green and the red. The bacteria yeah. have DNA as well, but the DAPI it's just the nuclear the green uh, blue signal just overwhelms the host DNA overwhelms given the size of that genome relative to the small bacterial ones. So now it's chaos like the board behind. <laughs> That's right. So this is um, art imitating science, imitating nature, or something like that. It's, um... And she, she, she thinks these studies <laughs> yeah. are mind blowing, and for sure they are. It's incredible, right? I agree. It's so fun. Yeah, and thanks to Fernando for sort of um, putting this one on our radar screen. Do we have prokaryotic DNA integrated mm -hmm. into our DNA? Yeah, absolutely. So this is um, uh, this notion of, and we kind of skirted around it. The authors actually go into a little more detail here. So horizontal gene transfer. This is the transfer of DNA in this case, or a gene or a set of genes from, um, you know, not through vertical inheritance. So the reason it's called horizontal transfer. So most of our DNA is vertically inherited, meaning our mother and father get together, fertilize an egg, and then uh, um, there's recombination, but there's, uh, we then move on as um, with most of the genomes, half from our mother, half from our father. 100% of our mitochondria is from our mothers, mm -hmm. by the way. Um, but in this case, horizontal transfer means instead of through vertical inheritance from your parents down to the offspring, there's DNA being shuffled through other mechanisms from um, uh, one um, genome to another. And so it's, that's where the phages come in again, or the other bacteria or the selfish genetic elements. They're sort of the mechanism or the machines that can move genetic material horizontally between um, not parent and offspring, but between two, mm. you know, entities to, and so the answer for um, humans, as far as we know, is pretty rare, um, but there are certainly cases, depends on the chain of custody. So if you just like remove it a couple steps, like um, start, you can start to discern between common ancestor, which is our, we have, we share a common ancestor with bacteria. If you go all the way back um, in, into the beginning or the origins of life, um, but then you can start to see these breaks in the tree more recently where genes are shuffled or horizontally transferred between lineages or between species. And so some, in some cases you see a lot of that. Um, there was for a, um, a minute, it was put out there. There was a pretty famous mm -hmm. paper that tardigrades, the water bears that uh, mm -hmm. might have a lot of horizontal transfer from bacteria and other viruses that would turn out to be a sequencing artifact for the most part. There are horizontal transfer events, um, yeah. but not as many. And so you have to be a little bit careful. It's really hard. This is where the sequencing technology um, sort of um, is like last generation iPhone camera where it's really easy to get to artifacts, to have blurry photographs here um, yep. that look like one thing, but sort of fool your eye. And so that's still a very active area of research. Some really cool. I, I, I'm into this topic um, in, in my lab and how retrotransposons might be moving genetic material between hosts, between viruses. And as viruses move between hosts, this could be the sort of the, the um, highway for horizontal transfer. But it's, yeah, it's a pretty, pretty uh, ongoing active area of research, I would say. So Matt asks, not that I am an advocate of intelligent design at all, but this system seems more coherent if we think of it in thousands of dimensions optimized for overall stability, perhaps. Yeah. So I like, uh, <laughs> I, sh I should probably, you know, should be careful not to dip too far into the um, theological sort of underpinnings here. But yeah, I think like thinking about it from stability is a good idea. Although there it's like having that bigger picture, right? So what can appear... Uh, or, or, or what do you mean by stable? So 50 years, certainly, but what about 500 years or 5,000 years or 5 million years or 500 million years? What, I guess, you know, we, as we talk about this, I think it's a useful concept, but also sort of kind of defining the parameters of stability. Um, I think that's a great, like, thank you, man. I mean, that's, that, that sort of, you know, inspires, I think, how do we um, continue research in this area to, to think about, um, uh, either optimizing stability or when stability collapses, how, like, are there hints to when that happens or again, how do you make those comparisons mm -hmm. to sort of put that yeah. into a bigger picture here? Yeah. And do you, and are there rules like that would be ultimately, you know, what you'd love to start to get at is so like, uh, as we, maybe if we sample all of protists or all of cryptomonads, even do you somehow converge on seven genomes? Is that yeah. like, is there something stable about that number or can it be 70 or can it be, you know, I think that usually the number is assumed to be four, 
Um, but I think, again, we've only kind of scratched the surface here. And so there might be all of these kind of interesting rules or principles hiding out um, under the hood of all of these possible natural comparison points. Pete wants to know if these horizontal gene transfer processes are accelerators in evolution. Yes, I think so. So the way I think about this is, um, you know, it's a mutation. So like the simplest of mutations, we've talked about this a lot, Vincent, right, is a point mutation. You change it. Uh, a nucleic acid letter, an A, T, C, or G to, uh, um, you know, you just swap those letters. A horizontal gene transfer process is taking a whole string of letters and dropping it into a, a genome in a new way. And so it's just sort of a more drastic example of a mutational event. And so um, it may be an accelerator in the sense that you've, you know, so to, to bring in something, let's say it's a thousand letters that show up for the first time versus making a thousand individual changes that might sort of encode that same difference. I think you could think about it an accelerator in that sense. However, like all mutations, it's also, so there's a rate that that happens. Um, the rate of horizontal transfer is probably, depending on the system, at or lower than the point mutation rate. Um, and then selection will act the same way. So most mutations we think of as deleterious, that's sort of the intuition of mutation being kind of weighing on you. Many of them not really having any impact or being neutral, and then a small set potentially being beneficial or sort of these jackpot mutations. And so in that sense, it's not an accelerator. It's just sort of within the rate of all of mutation. But in terms of that sort of potential game changer, um, a thousand changes at once or the introduction of a thousand new letters versus you know, sort of acquiring that in a point in a step by step wise manner, I, I would say yes. So other shade writes with this one being so complex and any ideas about why mm. our cells are so much simpler. What if anything prevents symbiosis like this to happen mm. in the common eukaryotes? Yeah, this is I love that question. What do you think, Vincent? Well, how would you answer well, that I, one? I, I, well, I don't know that ours are so much simpler. We have fewer endosymbionts, right? We have mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. mitochondria, basically in our in yep. our cells but um uh you know maybe the others have been absorbed <laughs> in some way into the nuclear <laughs> genome right <laughs> yeah i just don't know it may, it well, may be <laughs> just just counting organelles is probably not a good indicator right <laughs> agree also but there is a like there's a pretty drastic change from us in cryptomonads since our last common ancestor is multicellularity, right? So as right, soon as right, we right. became multicellular conglomerations, we kind of changed the game, right? In terms of, so there's cryptomonads that are out there and their ancestor is certainly phagocytic, as you're pointing out, Vincent, the amoeba that are just like shovel, shoveling in whatever particles they can find for food, whether it's viruses, yeah. bacteria, et cetera, the opportunity to get, you know, more and more of these things all piling up into some pseudo stable scenario. Um, the probability is probably working in your favor. As you go to multicellularity, we all we kind of look inside, right? And certainly on our surfaces, there are all kinds of microbes, the microbiome, et cetera. But we, we've kind of, you know, as multicellular critters, I think, erected these borders or, you know, part of our immunity somehow has um, maybe lowered the probability. And then once, and, and also maybe even more important, multicellularity sort of enforces this cooperation among our tissues or our organs, et cetera. And so that, I think that might change sort of the, the, um, at the cellular level, the kind of complexity that you would see versus these single cells, which are massively complex. I think this is, I'm glad you're bringing um, this up other shade because the, um, you know, I think there's, there's, um, intuition that single cells are primitive or are kind of simple relative to us. And in fact, it might be the reverse in this case, um, given all of this time, the same amount of time to evolve, you end up with these wild, sort of chaotic, messy alliances of all kinds of different genomes, which is pretty complicated and complex and pretty optimized to um, replication and living in a pond environment or brackish water or in the sea. These are the most, yeah. if you look at carbon turnover, if you look at energy production, these are the most successful, uh, you know, versions of life that we have um, around us. And Matt says, isn't everything a symbiont? <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, we're all addicted to each other, of course. That's right. Yep, yeah. Yep. Pete says, one of the big oil companies dumped its investment in algal mm. research for yeah. biofuels. Yeah, yeah that's know. right. And yep. so, yeah, and so that's where, you know, kind of this impulse to, so the kind of business practices versus what is the longer term value of basic science? Um, I would put this forward as, you know, but 
um, a lot of big oil companies don't have the runway. And so that's where I think yeah. I would say yeah. that our investments are public investments and basic science pay off in ways that might not be today, might not even be 10 years from now, but might be 100 years in ways that could, you know, really change the the whole trajectory that we're kind of find ourselves up against right now. Matt defines stability mm -hmm. not in years, but generations. Yeah, that's fair. I think that's a good way of, of thinking about it. For sure. And yep. Andrew says when stability on a large scale collapses, then we get mass extinctions. Yeah. That's true yeah. And so, right? that, yeah, good point. It kind of makes you think about that microcosm, right? Of is a cell mm -hmm. a universe, right? Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. All right. That's it for our questions. We were going to mention. I love it. So, yeah, else. I have, I do. So, I have, and I, I meant to get the, I'll get you the link um, here after the show that we can at least put on the website um, for episode 94 at the, um, at microbe.tv. So, this is, a link to a 2017 interview, actually in Current Biology, the same journal, of Patrick Keeling. And so Current Biology does these sort of one-page Q&A um, formats. And this is um, um, on Twivo 83, we, we had uh, Florian Modisbacher, who's one of the senior editors mm. at Current Biology. I think he does most of these interviews, actually. He did one for me is why I, I know that. But there's we'll, I point everyone to this link um, to get this insight from Patrick Keeling. And I just pulled out an excerpt here. So he says that science is moving faster than ever before, which is good in many ways, but does not land itself or does not lend itself to deep thinking. We lose sight of the importance of pure exploration, just looking around to see what the world is like and how it works. And so then he goes, I won't read the whole thing here, but he goes, you know, he talks about sort of weighing that against hypothesis driven research, which is sort of a massive engine, um, both of basic science and more applied stuff. Um, you know, having a well-defined question at the beginning versus that, ex that need to explore, discover new things, which is very much in the spirit of this paper. Um, and, you know, he points out that really groundbreaking discoveries in biology were stumbled on totally by mistake or by, or just mm -hmm. by looking at the unknown. And so, and in his field, which is like looking at these microbial critters, like that's kind of the whole game. And so that's kind of what, you know, again, I think brings this paper um, that makes it worth it for us to have this conversation together uh, as we're live streaming is exactly that. Um, and, you know, that, and so he points out now, so he, that this kind of work can be done by small labs. It doesn't have to be these massive conglomerations. I mean, this is unlocking or democratizing genomics. This is sort of the potential of it yeah. for us to look around. And I would say not only smaller labs, but increasingly, even in the years ahead, DIY genomics becomes more of a possibility. Um, and, and thinking about that, um, as all of us, um, or, or, or more of us kind of get into the game of searching or, or understanding the life around us. I have a, a friend and science buddy, Manu Prakash, who, who's well known as a frugal biologist. So he developed a $1 microscope and has sent millions mm -hmm. of these around the world. And there are people who are just picking this up and seeing microbes around them. Now imagine if you added a genomics component and could kind of unlock some of the biology that we've been talking about today, and then inviting everyone to do this together. How powerful that could be, especially as we're, you know, facing some of the problems with energy production and things like that moving forward. And so I think that's really, to me, the magic of this paper, of this conversation, is the possibility to, ins to inspire on that level. And so Keeling closes, he says a lot of funding is currently going in the opposite direction because it sounds like big science. And I'm sure that that's less effective. Some questions require uh, a large concerted effort, but many problems don't. It's this kind of approach. And so anyway, um, I thought that was a, a great way to sort of motivate um, this work or this discussion. I, I, I so agree because, yeah, I mean, we have technology to do big things. And so labs get bigger. They do all kinds of single cell seek, and massive metagenomics and so forth. And with hundreds of people, and I do agree with this first statement, but does not lend itself to deep thinking. I think people have too much data. They don't know where to go with it. They don't just sit around a table and, you know, throw out ideas, you know. And yeah. I think that's where the progress comes from. And I asked, so I interviewed uh, up at Cornell last week, uh, Ellen Rothenberg, along with Cindy Leifer for Immune. And I asked her, do you have to have a big lab to be successful? And she said, I don't think so. But uh, NIH wants you to have big labs. They really like the centers and and that yeah. sort of thing. And I don't think that's the right way to go. I think you can have a mix, and it's as effect. You should never go in one basket, right? You should always have a mix yeah. of everything that you can imagine. That's right. 
That's right. And so, I mean, I'm I'm reading um, the history of the atomic bomb now and how, mm-hmm. you know, the physicists at the turn of the 1900s, they used to have meetings all the time and talk about the results and go for walks and talk about the results. Nobody does that. They're too busy <laughs> analyzing all the data that they have. They don't have time for thinking about it, actually. So, yeah, yeah. I totally get this uh, this idea here. Yeah. Yep. I agree. It's very cool. See, we had a couple of other questions come in. I like how Nez described evolution here occurring along a non-orthogonal gradient from immunity to communication. That's mm. very cool. Thanks, Matt. Yep. Um, and uh, let's see. Great discoveries are made when the scientists say, now that is strange. Yes. Uh, that's right. That's right. right, Andrew. Yep. And Terasaki hasn't seen a live stream forever. Love to see you again. All right. Well, you're always welcome here. Yeah, agreed. Glad you're here with us. And and uh, Les showed up here. Thank you, Les. No, is it Les? Uh, yes, yeah, Les showed ah. up. And uh, and Tom has a dentist appointment. Dentist appointment. But uh, Andrew says I always use an excuse not to have a dental appointment. <laughs> That's <lot>. right. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Les, for bringing that forward. I thought Tom actually would love this paper, and so I was hoping he'd make it. But catch up with us, Tom, on the backside as you're watching the recording, and, and love to get your impressions of this too. I have a couple of emails now, so let's do this. Oh, yeah, let's do this. Yep. Want to take that first one, Nels? Brian? Sure. Yeah, Brian writes, Nelson Vincent, the discussion of minimal cells was fascinating. And so well-informed and informative. Thank you. So this is, the, our, I think, our last Twebo, episode 93. Um, and then Brian makes an important point here. So there's an um, elision between genes and genome which is confusing. The authors wrote that they removed nearly half the genes, which in their words reduced the smallest genome in lab culture, but a genome size is measured by its nucleotides, not its genes. Mm. Great point. So um, <clears throat> one sentence effort, or sorry, one sequence effort found, um, this is Mycobacterium mycoides, which is that minimal genome that we talked about on Twebo 93. Genome size is around 1.21 megabases. If it, is, if it initially had 901 genes, each gene is around 1 KB, then 0.3 megabases are non-coding. There's no data on the size of genes in this study. The 1 KB estimate is hand-waving. And I think um, my intuition is that the genes are, of the bacterial genes will be much smaller on average than 1 KB, actually. So if they remove the genes um, that were the same average size as those remaining, then perhaps the genome shrunk one-third given that non-coding sequences would take up relatively more space. And that's this is an important point. So I recognize that while eukaryote genomes are 97% or more, non-coding bacteria have a lesser percent, and viruses still lower, of non-coding sequences. But regulatory efficiency uh, is a bacterial hallmark. Let me speculate an explanation for the resilience of the shrunken organism. Regulatory sequences form complex networks that buffer change. Um, Analysis privileges protein coding elements, but sometimes think of these like kings. Uh, I think of these as kings in chess. They determine outcomes, but most of what leads to any checkmate involves a lot of pieces in play that is far removed. Perhaps uh, the Mycobacterium mycoides non coding elements reroute lost gene activity to existing genes or increase compensatory expression of other genes or replace some gene functions that do not involve amino acids. In other words, perhaps the study actually revealed a genome's unsung heroes are non-coding sequences. Anyway, it's worth remembering that genes alone do not make a genome. Keep up the good work, Brian. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great, great points, Brian. I hope I um, read that somewhat coherently. But yeah, to, that's kind of missing. Um, and, and I didn't read closely. There's is a companion paper just on the engineering, um, which might have some more of those details compared to the evolution sort of version of it where they then take that um, engineered version of the cell and then uh, passage it to see what happens um, in some of the conversation we had about those details. I, I agree with you though, Brian, they kind of leave the non-coding part, which is um, harder to put a finger on. It's harder to sort of define that as uh, it's a lot easier to do it for the coding regions that, um, as you say at the Kings on the chessboard um, are a little more conspicuous, but that's exactly right. And I think there's some like the, some really fun things to think about, not only for bacteria, but for viruses, like coronaviruses, for example, that have these relatively the big genomes. But how do you balance that mm. streamlined regulation where you have overlapping 
um, regulatory, so non-coding and coding regions and what that means for constraints um, or the potential to adapt to different hosts or under different conditions. And so that's a, I think you've put your finger on an important area of um, ongoing and future research is to integrate into what's going on in the non-coding regions and how as you mess with the coding regions, that's going to almost necessarily have impacts for bacteria, for viruses, even for you know eukaryotic cells with massive genomes with a lot of real estate there. I think there's more going on um, than meets the eye. Yeah, it's good. It's a very good point. Mm -hmm. uh, Benjamin writes, in Tuivo 91, Nell says that all eukaryotes have mitochondria. <laughs> Oops. And I would, I would have agreed with them, but it was paper <laughs> by Cesar Aljawari and Sandra Baldoff, an excavate root for the eukaryotic tree of life, suggests that many of the a mitochondriate eukaryotes that make up the paraphyletic excavata group are indeed basal eukaryotes whose lineage has mitochondria, and that their hydrogenosomes, rather than being degenerate mitochondria, are the result of an earlier endosymbiosis with a gamma or delta proteobacterium, and that the mitochondria causing alpha proteobacteria symbiosis divides are a morphia group, the plant's diaphoretics groups, and the excavate discoboclade from the more basal excavates. Whoa. <laughs> That I would have Guilt. to take apart a bit. <laughs> Guilty as charge, as right, charge. So what, what this paper is saying is that uh, some of the um, uh, eukaryotes that lack mitochondria, and apparently there are some, they have hydrogenosomes. Right. Uh, exactly. They had a, uh, a different endosymbiosis with a gamma or delta proteobacterium. And then the others, the ones we know of, uh, are the ones that got the alpha proteobacteria, which became our... To contemporary mitochondria. Is that right, Nels? Is that the idea? I think so. I think that's closer to reality. And I'm um, the first to confess that, yeah, I, I sort of, um, to say the least, sort of botched that part of the story. So I, I haven't rewound the tape, but I think if you went back to Twivo 91 in that moment where I was claiming that all eukaryotes have mitochondria, you might have seen a flash of panic in my eyes as I was totally bluffing or probably oversimplifying, to say the least, <laughs> um, that sort of deep part of our cellular history. And so uh, uh, maybe a, a victim of the heat of podcasting, right? It's this, we're talking about all this complexity over billions of years and trying to somehow distill this into something that's at least partially recognizable. And it's really like, that's why I love the, uh, podcasting, live streaming, tr communicating, having these conversations. But yeah, I, I totally confess to getting things wrong or oversimplified in this case, just totally wrong. <laughs> but, so. but our listeners uh, fix it. That's all good. Even better, like yeah, and and don't and please like keep correcting the record or calling calling me out on these things. I yeah, I, we we appreciate I love it. Um, civilized corrections, of course. <laughs> Just be nice. That's that's all. That's right. Sure. That's right. And we, that's we're right. happy to admit when we're wrong. Yeah, exactly. That's what education is all about. You know, you you teach people, and sometimes you make a mistake, and someone points it out, and you correct it. Um, yes. Sci and science is, is meant to be that way, too. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Vincent, let's move on to our science picks of the week. So right. um, I've got one that's maybe a little bit timely here. I don't know if uh, you or our listeners, I'm sure, have maybe been uh, following this from the news headlines. So um, the potential that the government's going to shut down on Saturday night um, has some implications for people who depend on um, scientists who depend on our taxpayer um, or public money here. So what happens at the National Institutes of Health, NIH, during a go governmental shutdown? Um, so the last one, which I think was about 10 years ago, which lasted a couple weeks, meant um, uh, the uh, ripple effects. So there are all kinds of um, massive effects, not only on the economy, military, all the like, and I'm not trying to minimize that at all. I think this is a um, slow motion disaster that we're watching potentially unfold before our eyes. But this also throws a wrench uh, in the works for scientists as well. So, in the last shutdown, that was a couple of weeks, that moved all of the grant deadlines a, a month back, and then all of the study sections a month back. And so things went on, and we kind of recovered and, and caught up, and were able to sort of recalibrate or restart the engine of science um, in terms of funding it. But that's a pretty big disruption. And, um, and when we think about um, the competitiveness of getting these limited resources to fund the ideas, like the ones we were talking about today, um, there are labs where if you just catch a snapshot of where they are in their funding cycle, 
delaying a month can feel or operationally be a real catastrophe. And so um, I'm just putting in my call, I guess, as my science pick of the week to um, for us to weigh kind of um, how well or not well we're being represented by the politicians in Washington who are, um, you know, put in charge of distributing or controlling these resources that we all need. Um, yeah, it's just yeah, uh, it's, it's uh, crazy. I mean, yeah. on, grow up, grow up, stop playing politics. It's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a lot of people's livelihoods are at stake, you know, That's right. and, and these yep. guys are playing politics, playing games. They've been doing it for years. For example, uh, many of the government labs, if you have animals yeah. and there's an interruption in funding, you can't come to work. So you have to sack, you have to euthanize the animals. Because yeah. no one will be there to take care of them, so you That's interrupt right. thousands and thousands of experiments that have to be restarted, and you, it's a waste of money, and it's inhumane. So, That's right. you know, at, at many levels, this is just a farce, and it's no way to get your way. I can't believe we're still doing this in the U.S. It's crazy. Yeah. It's wild. Yep. Yep. Anyway, that's my science pick of the week. Hopefully, um, well, I don't know. Actually, in today's news headlines, it looks even less promising that we're going to um, avoid this one. But we'll stay tuned and obviously kind of revisit some of these issues. How about you, Vincent? What's your science pick of the week? All right. So I have an article in Nature, um, which um, is open access, so you can see it. It's an interview with uh, Craig Venter, right, the guy who did one of the genome sequences many years ago, and then has sailed across uh, around the world, taking <laughs> samples and uh, done, done genomics on the samples. Really cool stuff. Yeah. And the minimal genome it's, from it's, Twivo 91. Yeah, that's right. And his Institute yep. uh, is, mm -hmm. is doing that minimal genome. So he's quite active. I think he's 76 years mm -hmm. old. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they talk about a lot of the questions um, are quite interesting. So basically there's a, a book um, about him. It's The Voyage of Sorcerer II, The Expedition That Unlocked the Secrets of the Ocean's Microbiome. And he co-authored this book with someone else. And this is in an interview where they talk about the book. And he says, you know, he, he sailed 65,000 miles and, and he's pretty much done, but he thinks it's important. <laughs> but he gets criticized for generating too much data and he kind of addresses that. Uh -huh. um, but one of, uh, talks about, potential plastic eating bacteria, which is pretty cool, um, AI. But then the last question is, uh, I'm assuming retirement is not on the cards. And that's <laughs> where the headline comes from. I consider retirement tantamount to death. I have my own research institute, an incredible team. Until we run out of interesting ideas, I want to keep going. And so I, I thought that was quite interesting because a lot of people retire, and, and I don't think – they consider themselves dying. You know, they have other things they want to do. <laughs> maybe yeah. they've they've had enough with their job or whatever. Or they, maybe they don't like it. That's fine. Um, yes, it's true that many people stop thinking when they retire and mm. um, degenerate, right, unfortunately. You know, a mm. good way mm. to prevent uh, neurological degeneration is to keep your mind active. Yeah. Um, so, I, th I mean, I looked at this headline in my – from my lens, right? Mm -hmm. Where I, I, people ask me all the time, so when are you going to retire? And I'm like, why would I retire? <laughs> why would I? <laughs> so, so I have two hats that I wear. I, I'm a professor at Columbia still. Mm -hmm. I don't have a lab, but I teach, you know, I teach a whole co course in the spring. And this semester I've taught, I don't know, eight lectures in different courses. I mean, it's not nothing. It's not two courses a semester. I understand that. Mm, uh, mm, but um, I keep doing that. I want to keep doing that. And the other hat, of course, is I have, I'm have. i here at Microbe TV making podcasts and trying to improve science literacy, right? Yeah. Um, and, I, and I want to keep doing that forever until I drop dead. There's just no way <laughs> I want to back off. And I don't golf. I don't want to go on vacation. I don't want to sit on a beach. I don't like any mm. of that. The most stimulating thing for me is to have these discussions with my podcasters that keeps me sharp why would i want to do that now at some point you know i, I will leave columbia because mm -hmm. i can't do that forever i'm gonna do yep. it for a while because i like to teach yeah and then it will be officially retirement from columbia right mm -hmm. because then i can get my retirement my pension and all that stuff but i'm not retiring from active thinking i'm still going to be here yeah. at microbe tv and i don't want to leave 
micro TV, right? I put this company together. I got people like Nels and many others to join me and, and convince them that this is a good thing to do. <laughs> yeah. I want to keep going. So I'll do it until I can't talk anymore. So um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I would say it's no. tantamount to death, but you know, Vendor no. is the same. He founded his own Institute. He's got a lot of smart people there. They're doing cool stuff. No. Why would he want to just go home and golf? I mean, yeah, I totally get that, Craig. <laughs> so that's what I, that's what I wanted to pick this yeah. for because yeah. you know, Nels, you're a long way from thinking, but I'm, ga I'm guessing <laughs> you're going to have your lab as long as you can until you're 80, uh -huh. 90 years old. Right. No. So, no. So when I read that headline, <laughs> first of all, I'm with you, Vincent, in terms of these transitions <laughs> and staying sharp, staying active, doing redeploying. I love that. And I'm with you. Um, when I read that headline, I consider tantam retirement tantamount to death. I want to retire immediately. Like I actually, I like the idea of sort of decoupling our scientific day jobs, what I do from the day to day mm -hmm. in terms of trying to hustle money, et cetera, keep the lab open, all of that. Um, from sort of these other transitions. So, you know, Craig Venter actually, it's, it's a great um, sort of balance maybe to that quote that I was um, bringing up from Patrick Keeling, calling for small science for exploration. I mean, the interesting thing here is I think Venter is absolutely an explorer, right? Just as you're pointing out, 65,000 miles of, um, you know, ocean expeditions, et cetera, um, to a very different outcome, right? Which is big data to big science. Mm. Those, again, those hundreds of people um, yeah. that are involved in it. And to not say that one's better or worse, but it's like sort of having both strategies sort of enriches sort of the science landscape around us somehow. But in terms of this notion, yeah. So yeah, I don't actually, I have a slightly different, I think the, maybe my generation of scientists have a slightly different take on this too, which mm. is, um, you know, when I'm 65 or whatever ish in that space, like, to kind of get off of the playing field in terms of running a lab, thinking about yeah, exactly yeah, sure. deploying, yeah. you know, in ways that could enhance science in different ways. Um, I've been daydreaming recently about, um, you know, one of the things I think is like kind of shameful about academic science is that as scientists approach sort of retirement age, if the NIH funding, not because necessarily the government is closed, just because it's so competitive goes away, they, there are these like basement offices or broom closets where you're sort of like ushered into as your lab space is taken away. What if we reverse that? Like I would, so I'm kind of try, trying to plan my own sort of soft landing here. What if we instead gave the best offices to these old, our older colleagues to yeah. then come together to sort of, um, you know, promote interactions or conversations that might not otherwise happen if we celebrated sure. that instead of hid that like to me. So that would, I would love like to retire my lab, but then show up in this like salon with five other sort of senior colleagues and then invite other, you know, or get on a podcast or all exactly what you're doing. And so for Venter, like, and fair enough, like, and you know, his last point is like the ideas don't end, but there's yeah. another balance here too, which I think is, you know, I can already feel that it's the younger generation coming up that has sort of grown up with some of these techniques, like the notion of, you know, I grew up doing like a hundred base pairs of sequencing in a day was good. And now it's like, a, you know, gigabases of data in a day is good. And so there's just something about the skill of navigating the technology, the ideas, et cetera, where I'm happy to step off and let the next generation come up, especially if I'm kind of holding that space. I'd love to see yeah, that sure. and then find a venue like this and, and count me in, Vincent. It's like, as long as uh, you want to uh, keep uh, hosting these conversations, you know, I'm here with you and, yeah. and, and we'll keep doing it as, as long as we can run. <laughs> but, but that, to me, that's like that process of retirement could happen within that sort of traditional job. And then letting, I mean, science is all, there's, you know, there's never the whole point of science is that the questions never end. And so how do we also kind of hand off the baton to the next generation? And well, so, I, I anyway. think we're saying the same thing now. Yeah, I agree. I agree with so you. You, yeah, you know, I closed my lab last year and at some point I'll leave, but I'm going to always do this because it's it's the transition. I built this as something else, right? Another direction, and this yeah. is what I'll do. And I'm, I'm, I hope you and others will will keep with me. But it's it's you know you you call it retirement when you leave the university, but it, your life is not retiring, right? Because you're just yeah. moving on to something else. But not not everybody does that. No one, everyone has True. the privilege to do that. Yeah, and I do think it's a privilege right. to yeah. be able to have something else that you found and built, right? So, that's what. Exactly. So Nels and I will keep uh, podcasting, right? That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line.
It, right. uh, yeah, even if we're the only two listening. <laughs> we'll have at least 10 people, you know. Yeah, we'll take it. Yeah. And uh, let's see, there were two comments I wanted to make here. Yeah, Patricia said, listeners are like a peer review board. Nice. That's yeah, absolutely true. Oh. I like that. T t uh, Tim said, the Ventner biography is a great book mm -hmm. as well. And uh, Pete says, I occasionally walk past the Crick Institute. Huge building must contain many small teams of biotech researchers. Yeah. All right. That'll do it for Tuivo 94. I want to thank our moderators today, Barb Mack UK, Les, and uh, Andrew from New Zealand. Thanks for joining us. Thank uh, you. And thanks, everyone, for coming. We appreciate your being here and participating in the, uh, the discussion. Always a lot yeah. of fun. And don't Great forget, fun. tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern, <laughs> I'll be back for office hours my uh two hour chat with all of you on mostly viruses but whatever you want to talk about as well if i'm qualified to talk about it awesome uh and let's uh get the music going here we have ending music and uh, nels went to see trampled by turtles recently right now. yeah good show that was fun yeah <laughs> you've been listening Oh, I forgot to do all the outro stuff. So uh, do it with stop the music. The music. Hey, oh, stop, stop the, the music. music. Stop, the <laughs> stop the music. You can find Twevo at microbe.tv slash Twevo. Uh, you can send your questions and comments to Twevo at microbe.tv. If you enjoy this work, we'd love to have your support. Yeah. And you don't have to be a huge supporter. You can give a few bucks a month. We'd appreciate it. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute nels eldy is at cellvolution.org l early bird on twitter thanks nels thank you vincent great to be together i'm vincent rack and yellow you can find me at microbe.tv and here we are back with the music which is <laughs> performed by trampled by turtles You've been listening to this week in evolution the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick thanks for joining us we'll be back next month till then be curious Bye-bye.